Uh, my name is Dana Dalrymple. Um, I'm one of the old, the long timers in this business, and uh, by sheer coincidence, uh, nearly 40 years ago, I got involved in discussions of these matters uh, when I was with USDA and USAID. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out, uh, when I my aid part involved uh, doing a discussion paper, number 30 I see, evaluating fertilizer subsidies in developing countries. Um, this was done in 1975. Uh, I've kept this at the back of my mind for a long time. Um, and uh, I, I will return to it now to see uh, what I covered in the uh, discussion paper. and as to whether it to, was reflected in today's discussions. I notice I have a section on fertilizer subsidies, one on fertilizer economics, another on policy alternatives. The question then, the most urgent question at that time was increasing fertilizer production in South Asia. And one way we facilitated this in some extent was to have a clause in the PL 480 agreements for the use of local currencies. And uh, uh, so that when we did a PL 480 agreement, we almost routinely put in a provision uh, for uh, sub, uh, subsidies of some sort, or more likely, uh, the increase of production facilities. So it's gone through a long cycle. Uh, much of it is recycled. Uh, and uh, but there are many other new dimensions. You have any questions? It's a comment. Thank you, Huntington Hobbs, okay, con consultant. Uh, question or comment, please. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah. Throughout the presentations, uh, what arose in my mind is whether seed subsidies behave any way significantly different than fertilizer subsidies, and particularly its impact on a national seed industry. Thank you. This side. Uh, I'm Xiao Zhang uh, from EPRI. You have talked about subsidies on fertilizer and many other type of inputs. You didn't mention uh, mechanization input. Uh, I think for Africa, mechanization may be more important than fertilizer because mechanization can help expand the land, arable land area, and fertilizer is mainly for intensive production and it may cause many problem, as you have pointed out. Uh, like in China, in Chinese case, most of the agricultural subsidies are actually on agricultural magnetization, uh, and it doesn't have any subsidies on chemical fertilizer. So there's a difference with, uh, with other countries. Hey, okay. last question before I come back to you. Okay, maybe, right. Uh, Karen Brooks from IFPRI. Thanks very much for a very, very good um, material and discussion. Um, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think maybe one of the things that we've learned from the work over the past five years is that in the African context, the actual response rate to increased applications of fertilizer was considerably less than was expected to be, even in very good years. And I think that may be a really important finding, if that's correct, if that's confirmed. That could be very important for positioning the subsequent discussions with governments about why it's important to have a more balanced um, array of investments and expenditures. Okay, well, let's come back to the panel. Seed, mechanization, application. I'll be happy to. Am I on? Okay, thank, thank you, Schengen. Thank you for those questions. Uh, let me just say one thing about the comment in the front here about uh, work that was done uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, you, uh, who was it, Keynes, who said that the uh, current thinking of you know, somebody who gets up and talks is un unwittingly reflecting the, the recycled thoughts of, 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 of an academic from 40 years earlier. Uh, I'd like to think that maybe that'll be the case in 2050, you know, for some of us around the table. So, so actually, you, you may have very well be, be a pioneer, you know, uh, 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 coming up with uh, these things 40 years ago. I'm sure that in one way or the other, we're, you know, all of the work that has been done is, is built on 
what's come in the past. Um, so on, on seed subsidies, we did have uh, a paper on that yesterday. And I don't think that the uh, people who are involved in that are in the room right now, but my recollection of the key findings of that was that it was slightly better uh, in terms of its impact. Uh, there has been, right, there has been some crowding in uh, of seed companies. And, you know, one could look today and say that the, the seed distribution systems in many of these countries are much better and much more competitive. Uh, it's a much more vibrant environment uh, than it is for fertilizer distribution. So, uh, so yes, uh, there, there do appear to be some differences. Uh, and then, uh, uh, Karen, uh, crop response rates. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, I, I'll share with you all, um, you know, uh, back in 2007, MSU and uh, Imperial, uh, Imperial University College, uh, so as, uh, we were involved in a joint evaluation of the Malawi program. And this was back in the day when there really wasn't very much data to inform the costs and benefits of this issue. And I remember that we had such a difficult time agreeing among ourselves of what that crop response rate you know, is uh, in order to kind of evaluate the impact of the program. And, uh, men, you know, that report is, I think, quite well known. I'm sure many people uh, have, have seen that in one iteration or the other. And uh, that report comes up with fairly decent uh, benefit cost ratios in one or two of the years. Uh, a lot of that was driven by a crop response rate of six to one, six kilograms of maize per one kilogram of fertilizer. But most of the evidence from that region since then, it's really coming in around three or four, uh, maybe. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean that we can't improve those crop response rates dramatically, and we should be able to do that. But uh, the, you know, just the evidence using survey data suggests the response rates are quite a bit lower, about a third lower than what we originally used back in those uh, early, you know, early reports. So. Thank you. Uh, on the seed, uh, Michigan State has done work, but I'd say one thing. Seed is a tiny cost of total production. It's a small cost. So when it comes to subsidy, it's not going to put a dent on the budget. So from that perspective, even though improved seed can have impact, it's not going to be big at the farm level. However, R&D investment for seed can be high. So the focus should be there for seed sector to develop. Uh, second point is uh, Javu's point, mechanization. I think we are talking about the stage of developments here. I mean, China started mechanization uh, rapidly, probably in the 90s, 80s, and mechanization in Asia started only, you and I have, have done the field work, we now see a small power tiller instead of a bullock plowing the land. So things are happening, but at a different stage. So question is, can we leapfrog and bring it in? I think that's a whole new research question. Um, Cadence, on the evidence of response, I think we are dealing with less than perfect measures, any way you do it. Yes, we are trying to improve it. Because we have so little information about the soil quality, especially disaggregated soil quality, it's very difficult to tell how good our response rates are. Um, if you drive through any muddy plain in Asia or a dusty plain of Africa, what you will see is soil is different within few kilometers. And we have and we use same fertilizer DAP everywhere. Uh, so the response rate you get is not the right kind of response rate. So that's why I was looking forward, I was thinking about it. And in fact, I can share with you uh, an information that Ethiopia is trying to set up blending facilities once the mapping is done so that the fertilizer blending according to the nutrient needs can be applied. And that can improve the response rate quite dramatically and also will give us info special information, especially disaggregated information about the cropping. Uh, I will stop there. Yeah, the response also depends on... Absolutely, yeah, it does. Uh, uh, I'm really Manage the right. Farm manage. Oh, well, I mean, irrigation. Yeah, absolutely. Not without irrigation, we're not responsible.
Okay. Okay. Eric and uh, Samuel, do you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, just um, on the first question, particularly on um, the seed subsidy and so on. I mean, I don't have um, the data on that for the region, but clearly, I think the evidence from the literature and and what we are saying is that uh, uh, the the impact of the subsidy on the fertilizer side is much more. Uh, uh, is having a much more negative impact, if you want, you know, than the uh, the the one on the on the on the on the seed, simply because some simply because if the if if you only take into account the environmental you know consequences of the subsidies in fertilizers, you know, the groundwater pollution, you know, the groundwater extraction, okay, excessive extraction, that's not always visible and counted, but it's having you know, a negative impact down the road. You know, pe uh, people, farmers not not having enough water to crop their crops and also uh, not even cropping, you know, high value crops, basically, you know, to be able to take advantage of market, but they are responding to the incentive of the, of the subsidies to actually grow the kind of <laughs> crops that are actually not bringing them enough money. Basically, because of subsidies, so that's what uh, I was saying. That Eric, maybe you can zoom in on your seed study in Ethiopia. Well, otherwise, uh, yeah. well, I, you know, I think seed is a different, is a different. I think the cost of as the point. Oh, sorry, uh, the cost of seed is usually such a small part of the cost that subsidies are, are not a very effective. Don't make a lot of well, difference. Access to seed instead adoption. of cost. Yeah, so it's much more on the regular the seed systems. I think it's much more on the regulatory side, uh, and opening up to private sector, which is what's happening in many countries. For example, in hybrid maize in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, while I've got the floor on the response issue, um, I think there's still need for more research on this. I think if you take purely the agronomic data that we have. And I, Val Kelly's sitting back there. She's assembled this for years. There's no difference in agronomic response on the rain-fed conditions in sub-Saharan, you know, on average, in sub-Saharan Africa than, say, in rain-fed conditions in Asia or Latin America. Uh, but what we're seeing from some of these studies is apparently a much lower response on the farmer's management than what we're getting from the agronomic data. Uh, and some of that could be just late planting because the fertilizer array arrives late because it comes through the, the subsidy system. So there's another cost of the subsidy system uh, there. Uh, it could be balance of nitrogen and phosphorus in many parts of Africa or micronutrient deficiencies, which have, we've known about for two or three, three decades, but we still haven't uh, tackled them. It's a very easy thing to, to tackle. So I think more, uh, I would advocate much more in the follow-up to this work, more work with agronomists to help understand what the, the risk crop responses are under different conditions and how obviously we have to move up crop response. Yeah, let's go to the second round. Nick, a friend. Oh, yeah, that one should start first. You had the microphone, you also had your hand up for some time. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Milad Pornik from the Global Gender Program at George Washington University. So I really like the data Tom brought up, but I'm wondering if you have data on uh, how directed they are in terms of the disaggregated by sex, the gender of these input subsidies, or just what's their gendered impact if those studies have been done. And secondly, in terms of surveys, you know, you mentioned this survey of 35 experts. Has there been, have there been surveys of the actual beneficiaries or local populations about their attitudes towards input subsidies? I'd be very interested to hear. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Nick. Uh, Nick Minot from uh, IFPRI. Um, Tom started out with a, a nice kind of summary of the conclusions of the workshop, uh, saying that there is an important role for import subsidies, but they need to be perhaps scaled back and redesigned, focused more on uh, targeted on uh, certain beneficiaries. And I think uh, over the discussion today, you've really substantiated the, the second part of that, that they're very expensive, they displace a lot of other investment, they tend to go towards the larger farmers. We didn't even talk about the issue of the fact that subsidies tend to uh, 
draw or, or, or allow the state to take a much bigger role in marketing of fertilizer. Um, but I'm wondering if, uh, if you can provide a little evidence behind the idea that there is an important role for fertilizer subsidies. Are there, is there evidence that uh, fertilizer subsidies are a more effective poverty program than conditional cash transfers? Or that they have, um, uh, let's say, that they pay for themselves in terms of increased production or reduced uh, food imports? Just want to follow up on, that, on the evidence for that, that aspect of your conclusion. Okay, thank you. Ephraim. Ephraim from IFPRI. My question goes to Tom. Uh, your last question was about what can we do to make, to pass our message to the public. Now, I'm a Minister of Agriculture and I want to spend 100 US dollars on, on my budget. How much should I allocate to rural roads, extension, and also the subsidies that you have told me? So can you tell me a very simple message which I can use as I develop my budget to present to the Minister of Agriculture, or the Minister of Finance? Well, let me finish this part, the so Rajo, then we come to this part. Thank you. Rajul Pandya Locha Difpri. Tom, early in your presentation, you said $2 billion are being spent on subsidy programs in Africa. And my question to you is, is it just a few countries spending a lot or a lot of countries spending a few? Because the question you asked is communicating to governments. Which governments would you want to communicate with? So would you want to communicate with those that currently have and or those that are contemplating also? So I think that would help you to answer your communication question. Okay, um, three hands this side, right? Why don't we just finish this round and come back to you? All right, starting from the second row, the microphone. Ah, sorry, well, um, I thought that you have, all right, sorry. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed this presentation. It was very stimulating. My name is Tom Herlihy. I work with Land of Lakes. Um, I'd like to talk about the response rate in Africa. I, I really appreciate the point about soil testing. Uh, I've been working with farmers in Kenya, Malawi, and Zambia for the last four years. Uh, in Kenya, Mia, the fertility company, now has a mobile soil testing unit for about $10 you can get a soil test right at your farm. I think you know we have to look at more of those things. In Malawi and Zambia, farmers are sending their soil to South Africa to get a soil test done. So you can see a smallholder is not gonna do that. Um, I really liked your point about traditional farming practices. Farmers, when they start using hybrid seeds, still put two, three, four seeds in a hole, okay? That's not a good use of your hybrid seed, okay? Uh, and I think that gets into the agronomic advice aspect of it, but there's one word I, I haven't heard yet here today. Weeds. When you use fertilizer, what happens? Weeds really do well. And there are labor shortages in Africa at peak times, and one of those peak times is during the growing season. So what about the role of crop protection products? Pre-emergent, post-emergent herbicides, it gets into the whole idea of a unified package that really has to go to farmers. Because to get at the gender question, who's doing the weeding in the farms? It's women. And they have a lot of demands on their time. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. I think there's a lady just before you uh, had a microphone before. I took away the microphone for, from her. Um, yeah, I just, uh, my name is Shafali. I'm with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. I was wondering if you also looked at um, some of the indicators like balance of payments and food security indicators when you looked at the subsidies, particularly 2007, 2008, post that, and see how the subsidy and the actual package of wh what countries are investing in in their agriculture budget correlates with some of the food security issues, income livelihood issues, and balance of payments. Thanks. All right. The one right behind you from IDB. Uh, Sergio Ardila from the IDB. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very clear, very stimulating. I have a simple question. Um, I wonder whether you uh, study why farmers don't use fertilizers more. It's just a matter of uh, crop response or there are some other factors? 
David, the last question. Uh, David Orton from IFRI. Uh, I'm going to address my question to Shahid. Uh, anyone on the panel might want to answer it. But uh, I guess my question is whether we're looking at this in too narrow a perspective and maybe have thrown in the towel too soon on thinking that input subsidies are something we have to live with and we should just figure out how to make them work a little better. That's why I'm addressing it to you, Shahid. Because it seems to me that a lot of the countries that are providing input subsidies are also discriminating against farmers on the output side by keeping, even if they have a price support program, they're actually keeping their output prices below import parity levels if they're an importing country, for example. So on the output side, farmers are being depressed. We saw a lot of that when world prices shot up in 2008, lots of countries putting on export restrictions and so on. So their own farmers couldn't benefit from the higher price. And then those same governments turned around and said, well, we're discriminating against you on the output side, but hey, we'll come along, we'll give you some help on the input side. So you get into not just this issue of the fertilizer subsidy itself, but a sort of mix of policies towards the agricultural sector. And so because you've got a bad policy in the output side that's not letting farmers reap some of the benefits of opportunities they have on the output side, you're getting all mucked up and fooling around on the input side with all these complicated programs of targeting and you know where the subsidies are going and, and whether they're effective and so on. So Shahid, I'd like to address you to address the question of our, are we throwing in the towel too soon on the whole mix of agricultural policies and coming to this sort of, let's call it, nth best conclusion that well, we'll have to live with input subsidies. All right, thank you. So let's go back to the panel. Uh, Shahid, why don't you start? Because you know, the last question was addressed to Shahid. <laughs> okay, I, I'll go back to Nick's question, actually. I think that's a very, very good question. And we've talked about it quite a lot. Oh. Nick, I'm responding to your question. Uh, we actually talked quite a lot about that issue during the last two days. So you have money. Do you spend it on fertilizer subsidy to reach the poor, or do you spend it to reach to the poor through a different mechanism? One issue we talked about, when you use money, you target food for the safety net programs, there are a lot of advantages. One advantage is you can use the self-selection. What is self-selection? Self-targeting, which is, suppose they're building a road. A rich guy from the village is not going to do that work. So as a result, that is better, more efficient to do it that way. Uh, on the other hand, when you are doing the fertilizer subsidy, although smart subsidies voucher, you can bring, take the vouchers, get the fertilizer, come back to your village, and sell half of it. So there would be leakage in that way. And also that we talked about the leakage, which is about 30%, is happening, is creating moral hazard problem in that sense. Because you have this incentive to sell and make money out of it. It's a fungible thing in that sense, not directly. Uh, one difference, one slide that I did not emphasize during my presentation is during the Green Revolution till today, subsidy in India, fertilizer subsidy particularly, was not never rationed. Rationed in the sense that you get subsidy at the mill gate, get the fertilizer, it goes through it, Anyone can buy it. If you have a dealership license, you can get it, and someone can come and buy it from you. In the smart subsidy, we are introducing price rationing. So this is a whole issue, set of issues we have not fully dealt with yet. But we have information on cost-benefit ratios, which Tom will share uh, about this smart subsidy program. OK. Second thing is, uh, coming back to David's question, uh, no, we are not, David. Uh, we are just looking at input subsidy program. What I was trying to do, make a comparison with Asian policies and endowments with the African context at this point. And if you dig down deep, fertilizer subsidy itself is not that big. Subsidy is bigger component of subsidy is in the safety net and other thing. And also, in our presentation yesterday, my last slide was, presenting Kim Anderson's summary report. So if you look, what you see is that in the early years, in the 70s and 80s, that was positive. Farmers was, was being supported. He uses term nominal rate of assistance, which was positive for most of uh, in that time, but became negative 
in the 90s or 80s when they're suppressing prices. We are aware of that. That will be flagged. But for the special issue of this agricultural economics and for this particular project, we are focusing mainly on the input side. I'll stop there and pass on to Phew. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> All right, no. Thank you, Shahid. Yeah. Uh, is this on? Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, so I think around 15, 20 minutes ago, someone was asking about the gendered impacts of, uh, of these programs. And um, yes, uh, th that, that has been examined. There's two dimensions of that that like, we could quickly talk about right now. Uh, the first one is to what extent did female-headed households actually receive uh, input subsidies? And uh, in the beginning of these programs, uh, female-headed households appear to be less likely to have been less likely to have uh, received these subsidy uh, uh, vouchers. But that's changed uh, in the more recent surveys. And uh, uh, so the, 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 the latest data indicate that female-headed households are not less likely to obtain these uh, vouchers than, than most households. And in fact, in one survey, they're actually more likely to obtain them. So, so things seem to have turned around a little bit on that front. Uh, in terms of response rates, uh, there's evidence to suggest that female-headed households might get slightly lower crop response rates than male-headed households for, for reasons that uh, I'm not, not sure we have uh, that nailed down, but, uh, but, but that does seem to be the, the indication. I have a response to Nick, too. Um, so, Nick, uh, that's a very interesting question. You're basically pushing us to say, uh, you know, we've pointed out uh, why, why are we in favor of, of subsidies in some role, and what would that be? What's the evidence to suggest that, that there's some validity of taking that position? Uh, I, given the, the, main, the major gap between uh, what is currently being achieved in terms of response rates and high levels of crowding out and diversion of program fertilizer and so forth, and what could be achieved with seemingly feasible, uh, you know, implementation changes, um, I guess my view on the, that there is a role for them is based on what could be achieved uh, with the right effort and the right political uh, uh, galvanization. Uh, rather than just basing it, it on what's happened so far. Um, I think if we just base it on what's happened so far, there's pretty limited uh, evidence to support, to, to come up with that position. Um, okay, Derek and uh, Samuel, do you have any quick interventions? Uh, just, just a couple of reactions. I, I, I have to have a go at David because uh, I don't think there's much evidence that on food crops, uh, that you're being discriminated against by policy in sub-Saharan Africa now. Uh, I was just looking at tariffs for rice. The East African tariff is 75% on rice. Ghana, it's 40% plus a whole bunch of other costs that bring it up to close to 70%. So rice in particular is highly protected, and that's not necessarily what we want in terms of food security for poor people. I think maize prices, the evidence is pretty clear that that's pretty much around import parity in, in most countries uh, now. Uh, and then the second quick comment is on, on weeds. I actually had that in my notes, but then Shingen told me to cut, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but, but I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a very valid point, and particularly since many systems labor is a, a critical Wanna constraint, as you know. Uh, but, you know, you, when you get into weed control, you get into the same issues as labor as a constraint. So, okay, we've got technology through herbicides, uh, but I was in Mozambique a couple of weeks ago. To do that, you needed $50 per hectare up front just for that. So you get into the same. I think you've got to recognize that many farmers, <coughs> most farmers probably, smallholders are cash constrained. And, and how do you deal with that cash constraint? And that's why we're dealing talking about input subsidies. Well, there's a micro-application of fertilizer would prevent weeds. You just ap apply the fertilizer around the roots of that crop. I mean, the micro-application could help. Now, Samuel, do you have any final interventions so, before we conclude? Yeah, just um, I want to react to Ephraim's hypothetical question. <laughs> you know, hypothetical question are always difficult to answer because 
you need to put them in context. Yeah. You know, what country are you talking about? What is the stage of development? You know, so you can't get a clear cut answer for that one. Mm-hmm. So you need to be very much precise. But if I take the, the case of uh, the country that I'm working on, India, for instance, to, especially for that, then there's a history. Then I will say, Mr. Minister, you know, we know what Fetlas is doing, how much, you know, money it is, or, uh, dread, how much drain is on your budget. I would like you to spend, you know, um, at least 50 or 70 percent of that in the eastern part of the country, where you have water, you have lack of infrastructure, and then where you can actually grow more rice, and so on. So, you need to. Uh, the answer will depend on the circumstances. As opposed, if I'm, for instance, uh, in uh, you know uh, Malawi or, or Tanzania, the answer will probably be different uh, depending on where it is. So I can't. Uh, Give you a clear answer for that. Uh, okay. You wanted to. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'll I'll try to make it quick. Uh, Ephraim, I noticed that you took the question that I posed to the group and you turned around and and uh, asked it to me again. Um, so so anyway, nice job there. Uh, so your 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 question was uh, what you know how to be more if, uh, you know how would you articulate the right message to uh, the minister of agriculture. Um, I don't have a very good, you know, answer to that, uh, um, but I do know that when we're spending 0.5% of our ag budget on R&D and we're spending 30% on subsidies, I, I would feel comfortable with a message to the Minister of Agriculture saying, I think we need to reallocate that, uh, you know, a little bit. Rajul, you said uh, your question was which countries uh, are, are, you know, is it many countries all doing it or is it a number, a small number? It's really seven, uh, seven big ones. Uh, and of those seven big ones, um, I think the ones that are getting the most visibility as a test case are certainly Malawi, but now Nigeria, biggest country in, in, in Africa. Uh, they're just get gearing up for a very uh, big round of input subsidy programs. Uh, Akin Adesina, who's the Minister of Agriculture, a huge advocate. Uh, he's um, also a politic- he's an um, uh, agricultural economist, just like us, from uh, Purdue University. I uh, don't know what's going on with Purdue, um, that we're, we're <laughs> you know, but, but we're, uh, anyway, Akin is, uh, you know, in very, um, y- uh, that this is going to be a very, very important test case, and I hope we can study it uh, carefully over the next few years, so. Okay, well, thank you very much. And then, and let me offer you some of my thoughts on this issue. Obviously, this issue have also been my thinking for 20-some some, some years, you know, started my work in India. Uh, and then later on other countries. Um, to me, whether there is a role of subsidies is an empirical question. Do we have the data, do we have the evidence to show the returns from fertilizer subsidies higher than returns to investment in R&D, in irrigation, or subsidies in credit? It's an empirical question. You can analyze that, but the theoretical background is the subsidy, certain subsidy, particularly in the initial stage, can help to correct the market failures. The smallholders will not be able to access to, to seeds, to fertilizers, to many other input irrigation. So the India started with a package. So it's not just a fertilizers. I emphasize the package, package of fertilizers, seeds, irrigation, credit together. Probably you can called magic that time, Manawi, I, I, I know less about Manawi. So it's an empirical question. Do we have the data? Do we have the evidence to show the impact is greater than other investment? Not only in terms of economic returns, but also in terms of poverty reduction, in terms of food security. I would push you guys to analyze this. Then you can really convince other researchers. Otherwise, this debate will, will continue. Now, um, we also heard that the fertilizer subsidy needs to be better targeted. Um, right? Universal subsidy is not going to work. In fact, universal subsidy sometimes um, just do the opposite. The small, the, the larger farms will receive much higher support from from the government. We have seen that in Nigeria. We have seen that in India. Now the question: How can we move away from that targeted to smallholders? Um, 
and avoid corruption as well. In many countries, the fertilizer distribution is controlled by the state. In Nigeria, the first thing what Akin did is to move away from the state, sub state universal subsidies to target to smallholders using this, this so-called e-wallet. E -wallet. So the smallholders will be able to know how much subsidy they have got so th through an electronic message. So I think that sort of subsidies, well, again, the question is whether Akim is moving towards a very large scale inefficient subsidies. If it's targeted, well managed, return could be very high. Again, it's an empirical question. Now, um, moving towards political economy of uh, subsidies, Regina Berner at APRI has done a study to look at uh, the uh, political economy issues of electricity uh, and irrigation subsidies in India. I think we have to move away from ministers of agriculture. It's not his decision or, or, or her decision. It's a whole political process. Sometimes it's the farmers. Do farmers have the knowledge about alternative subsidies or alternative ways to support them? In, ca uh, in, in the case of India, instead of universal subsidies, free electricity, if we can target our subsidies, reduce the cost, improve the reliability, well, the farmers probably will be very happy to see that. So I pay for something that is reliable. I'm probably as a general citizen, you probably agree with that. You don't want it to pay something that it, or you don't want it to have something free but not reliable. That knowledge has to be communicated to farmers, communicated to parliament members, congressmen. Then they push the whole reform bill. Then the Minister of Agriculture and Administration will respond to that. Just for your information, right now in India, they are debating about this issue, cash transfer, food security bill versus subsidies. Different arguments, different political interests. What is the role of IPRI, MSU that can bring evidence into that debate? I still feel that we need a lot of evidence and lots of data to support that debate. Otherwise, the political uh, process will, will continue without much evidence. So for that, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's thank the two uh, presenters and the two discussants for this very exciting debate here.